community. So with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Allison Ventura, who's an associate professor in the Doc Department of uh, Kinesiology and Public Health at California Polytech State University. She is also the director of Cal Poly Health Kids Lab and associate director for the research training and fellowship for Cal Poly Center Health Research. For the past decade, Dr. Ventura's research has primarily focused on infant feeding interactions and understanding how these inter interactions affect development, dietary preferences, eating behaviors, and growth trajectories. She's particularly interested in the bi-directional and the dyadic interaction and how that impacts feeding and child's behavior and development. Much of her recent work focuses on promoting responsive feeding during breastfeeding, bottle feeding, and the introduction to complementary foods and beverages. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Dr. Allison Ventura. Hey, thank you so much. I am just delighted to be here and to share um, the work of our group and others um, that I hope will really help you in your research and practice and thinking about how to support families and new mothers um, in our modern times where we have lots of opportunities for texting, TV, other forms of media, and thinking about how to integrate this into family life. So to get started, I'll give you a little overview um, of what we'll be thinking about today. And I, I should I just check, is everything looking okay? Are my slides? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so where we will begin is thinking about um, the concept of responsive parenting. I'm guessing this is a very familiar idea to many of you, so um, I won't spend too long on this, but I do want to just kind of give us some focus and, and context for thinking about um, the potential role and impacts of, of media and device use within family contexts. Then we'll specifically think about feeding, which is the area that I've been working in and have been really interested in, but um, kind of emphasize how this is really a context for parenting, especially during infancy, um, and think about, you know, how, how this fits into our broader goals for promoting responsive parenting. We'll then look at tech use. I mean, I think we have a sense of how prevalent tech use is in our own lives, but look at some data of, of how much families are using technology, especially during early feeding interactions. And then really spend most of our time thinking about, is this something we should be worried about? Is it something that's fine? What does the research tell us so far? Um, and what can we start to think about telling the families that we work with um, and recommending to them related to their tech use? All right, so let's start with thinking about responsive parenting. And I just want to start with a, a cute little clip that will um, hopefully kind of illustrate some of the things we'll be thinking about. Uh, so we, I have a, a video for you on the next slide of, you know, two buddies, uh, a father and son, who are watching TV together. Um, and as you watch this 30 second clip, I just want you to think about what you're noticing in this interaction and um, whether you think this interaction would be beneficial or detrimental in terms of outcomes. Okay, so here we go. Yeah. Like go somewhere else with that, but don't break here, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what I said. He was like, ah, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, what in the world? Don't do it here, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. <laughs> we think a lot alike, huh? <laughs> All right. So hopefully some things that you notice in this interaction was that it was rich, right? The the baby doesn't have words yet, but they were having a really fun conversation about the TV show that they're watching together. And Part of that was facilitated by the baby who was turning to the father and chatting with him with his his babble and his motions, um, you know, looking for eye contact and connection with his father. But um, a big part of that was the father responding to that, right? He was engaging with his son uh, in, in a way that his son wanted to, and it was, it was communicating to, to him through his vocalizations and his behaviors. And so we had a really nice, what we call serve and return reaction. It, interaction there. Um, 
where where the, the father and the son are really engaged in a way that's developmentally appropriate at the level that the child is at, but also really serving a lot of needs for the child, right? Of learning the, the back and forth of social interaction and feeling the warmth from the parent, getting that message of you're important to me. Uh, what, what you say and do is something that I'm attentive to and responding to, and I'm here to help you kind of learn this and support you as you're, you're doing things that are enjoyable to you and help you grow. Um, so, so these serve and return interactions, which was um, a, a, coin, a, a term developed by researchers at, at Harvard, uh, coined by their research on these sorts of interactions, um, are, we know that these are really important uh, for healthy relationship building and, and for supporting um, child development among many different domains. And it's termed serve and return because probably as you saw in that interaction, much like a tennis match, there's a, there's a back and forth going on here between parent and child where the child serves to the parent by showing interest in something or in the parent and the, the parent plays along. So, um, so some key features of these interactions are that the parent and child take turns back and forth in some sort of interaction. Uh, the parent is really there as a support and encouraging the child's interest and behavior so that the parent is letting the child lead here in many ways um, based on what they're interested in and what they're communicating to the parent. Um, we also often see, you know, naming that the parent also realizes there can be a scaffolding here um, and and allows the, the child to kind of learn the names for objects or the words that they might eventually use in this sort of interaction in the future. Um, there's a shared focus between parent and child, and it's really helping the child practice beginnings and endings to different um, scenarios that they may encounter you know, in the future. And we, again, saw this really beautifully done in, in that video clip that all these things were present and was, were great support for the child's early, early learning around conversation and, and engagement with others. And um, this, these serve and turn, return interactions are really exemplary of, of this broader concept of responsive parenting. Um, and we, again, know that responsive parenting is similarly just very beneficial for children. It's, it's what we want to support parents to achieve, where we have these uh, consistent interactions and contexts where the parent is attentive to the child, recognizing and understanding the child's cues and their developmental needs. Um, and they're modifying what they do. They're, they're not just using the same strategies, but they're understanding um, okay, this is what my child is expressing to me and, and I need to shift what I'm doing and how I'm approaching it to make sure I have a, a goodness of fit with my child and, and what they need. And uh, decades of research have illustrated for us that this is very beneficial for children when they have responsive caregivers, uh, that it really benefits virtually all domains of development. We see associations between responsive parenting and early achievement of language milestones, higher scores on cognitive tests, better social skills and social emotional development, more secure parent-child attachments, um, fewer emotional and behavior problems, better self-regulation and growth trajectories. So this is a really, really important goal um, for you know, supporting families to achieve. So let's move on now to thinking about feeding as an early context for parenting. Um, so, you know, we may on the surface think of feeding as opportunities for good nutrition, but um, we know that the, the, whether the baby is receiving breast milk or formula or the composition of their diet is only one piece of what they get from feeding interactions. And um, we think deeply about how both what and how infants are fed matters. And so the, not only the feeding practices that parents use, but the context that they're creating during these feeding interactions is, is important for healthy uh, outcomes for, for babies. And so our current um, research and guidelines really support this idea of responsive feeding, of conceptualizing these ideas of responsive parenting within the context of feeding. And when we can help parents to achieve responsive feeding, um, it's recommended that, that we support parents in doing this so that we can support healthy intake patterns and growth for the babies. Um, and so again, you know, similar to what we talked about with broader uh, parenting interactions, within a responsive feeding interaction, a child is able to signal hunger, fullness, um, needs for engagement and disengagement. And the parent is attentive to those signals and is able to respond in ways that support 
self-regulation, social, emotional, cognitive growth, and autonomy for the baby. And so this means that when we have responsive feeding interactions, this is really a, a, an opportunity for good nutrition, but also much broader than that, that it's opportunities for the baby to learn about self-regulation, but also social interaction, um, opportunities for eye contact, smiling, connection between the caregiver and the baby. And so this is also a really important context for social emotional growth fostering and cognitive growth fostering. And um, I just want to emphasize too that th this is important throughout the lifespan for families, but um, we can think about this as being especially important during infancy because it's where families spend a lot of their time, that young babies are feeding frequently, you know, eight to 12, sometimes more times per day. Um, these feeding interactions can last between five to 60 minutes, depending on the mom and baby. So there's a significant amount of time invested in feeding. And so this means we have many opportunities during feeding to um, have these responsive feeding interactions that are promoting um, many different outcomes beyond just good nutrition. And again, to emphasize, we really think about responsive feeding as a facet of responsive parenting. Um, that is just kind of one, one context in which responsive parenting can play out, where we have this really nice balance between parent and child that's facilitated um, in, in some ways initially by the parent, creating routines and structures, expectations, emotional contexts, um, and, and, you know, the foundation of this is parent attentiveness um, that's promoting interaction. This creates an environment where, um, you know, the infant can signal what they need and have that be responded to. Um, and ideally, we want these responses to be uh, prompt um, and want them to be emotionally supportive, contingent, and developmentally appropriate. And over time, uh, one of the proximal benefits of this is that the infant is repeatedly experiencing a predictable environment that's shaping their understanding of themselves as a important agent within their world, um, building their trust that the, the adults in the world are there for them and, and there to support them. And so this is all really an important foundation for, for the child's learning. So um, to just kind of emphasize, you know, what we talked about in these two areas, um, overall, we, we know that responsive parenting is a really important foundation for early development. So our overall goal is for parents to be attentive and for them to use that, you know, attention and what they pick up from their children to be able to respond to their child's cues and needs. And, um, you know, within that attentiveness and responsiveness to be able to modify what they're doing um, to meet what their child needs to, to promote um, the, the benefits of responsive feeding. So let's now move on to thinking about technology use and how that might fit into this responsive uh, feeding and parenting model that we just talked about. So um, we're well aware that mobile devices have really become a fixture in our daily lives. And just to give you some statistics to emphasize this, um, the Pew Research Center is uh, one of the foremost institutions that's doing research on you know, how, how we use our devices and how much we use them. And so data from this institute show that um, the vast majority of adults own a, a mobile device, 96%. And this idea that you may have heard of a, a digital divide, that you know, we have um, demographic differences and in particular social demographic differences and who has access to technology, um, research from the, the Pew Center shows that this is actually fading, that this is really cutting across social demographic factors, that even lower income household own mobile devices, and indeed they, they might be even more reliant on these devices as their primary form of internet access. So, um, so we really, in this day and age, have a pervasive use of, of mobile devices um, that cuts across many different um, uh, sociodemographic uh, characteristics. Um, other data where there's um, passive sensing of a device use, some objective measures of how often we use our devices suggest that we check our devices every 12 minutes um, and interact with our devices an average of 80 times per day. And so if you think about your own use, you know, maybe you don't even notice because it's it's quick, you're, you know, picking it up here and there whenever you get a notification. So um, I challenge you to maybe pay attention over the next day of, of how much you're using device, your devices and see if this is accurate for you. But um, 
you know, the, these numbers are always, anytime I look at them, present them, they, they still don't fail to shock me because it's like, wow, that's a lot of use. But at the same time, it's, yeah, I, I guess I probably do do that, right? Because I always have my phone with me. I always have um, some, some need for it and that's how they're designed. And so um, we see that specific to parents and families, similar trends that, um, that these data really suggest the, the, these digital technologies are really infused within family life and context. And so um, today's parents spend four to five hours per day using technology and mobile devices. And again, the objective data that we have where they have actually measured device use, you know, using a phone, it's not self-reported data, suggests that parents are checking their far smartphones um, at an average of 39 to 67 times per day. Uh, and when we actually ask parents about their device use, they some of them express concern. They feel that they they are distracted by technology when with their children. They wish that they could change their um, technology use and and are concerned about the potential interference that technology may have. Um, but I will say this is some parents. Other parents maybe aren't as concerned um, and see a lot of benefits to their device use. So there are mixed feelings around it, but it's important to think about not only how much are parents using their device, but how do they feel about it and what are their, their needs uh, and to change their behavior or perceived needs. And we've been particularly interested in technology use during early feeding um, because, as I mentioned before, of the volume of time spent in feeding. Um, we know that these interactions are really central during early infancy. And so if we have uh, a parent who's feeding eight to 12 times per day, uh, they, they might want things to <laughs> fill that time, um, especially if, if they're not thinking about responsive feeding, responsive parenting, and rather thinking about, I'm spending so much time feeding my baby. Um, this might be a really opportune time for families or, or for parents to be watching TV shows or using their devices because it's a time to, to sit down and, and maybe do something else. And so, um, so we've kind of been interested in this just in what we started seeing in our laboratory about a decade ago when we would see a lot of device use in our um, feeding observations that we did, but also in you know what we would see anecdotally out, out in the field of, of um, families using devices when feeding their babies and with the increased um, use of devices uh, across the, the globe. Um, so we, um, have looked at specifically how often mothers are using their devices during feeding. And so um, in a series of studies that we did um, back in uh, 2015, we um, had mothers keep three-day feeding diaries for us. And so, um, you know, they wrote down every time they fed their baby and what they fed their baby, how long they fed their day baby. But we also asked them, what, if anything else, were you doing while feeding your baby? It was open-ended questions, so they could have reported anything to us. And uh, when we went through and analyzed these feeding diaries, we found that for many feedings, moms didn't report anything. And some of these were maybe overnight feedings, um, or, or spread across the day. So, so I was promising that, you know, there was nothing, uh, nothing reported for many of them, but we did uh, find that for about a quarter of feedings, there was some sort of technological distractor involved that the mother was watching TV or using her mobile device or using a computer. Um, for 17%, there was some sort of non-technological distraction like they were reading or interacting with other family members or children. We did find a lot of individual variability in this though. So there were some mothers who reported they never used uh, technology during feedings, whereas others, it was every single feeding that they reported they were watching TV or using their mobile device. So there was there was a range in responses to this, but the average was um, about 30% you know, of feedings. Uh, mothers were using some sort of technological distractor. Um, but we did see that the vast majority of mothers, about 83% reported a technological distraction during at least one feeding. In additional research that we did where we had a, a questionnaire that assessed um, how often mothers were using things like television or computers or doing things like reading during feeding, um, we found that over a third of mothers reported that they were often or always engaging with technology during infant feeding. And so within this table, you can see that um, about 40% reported watching TV while breast or bottle feeding their baby, whereas about 20% said they were using their computer and um, almost 40% were texting or uh, often or always texting or using apps. 
Um, we also asked them what they were doing um, during non-feeding times too, as illustrated on the bottom, and uh, use of technology during non-feeding uh, infant care times was less, but still, um, still something that, that moms were reporting. And interestingly, we um, also saw differences whether a, a mom was breastfeeding or formula feeding her baby, that we actually saw um, that mothers who were doing any breastfeeding reported uh, greater levels of technological distraction during feeding. Um, so as you can see by the, the um, two lines, on, the bars on the left here, that the gray bar is moms who are doing any breastfeeding, the blue is formula feeding moms, and there is a significantly greater frequency of um, using technology during feeding for our breastfeeding moms compared to formula feeding. Um, but there was no dis dis difference in their perceived distraction. So they didn't feel they were more distracted um, during feeding based on, on uh, their mode of feeding. Um, so this is kind of a notable trend that they, this may be um, a, a Point of intervention um, if we see this more frequently in breastfeeding that we can kind of support these moms in the ways that they, they need it. And in some ways maybe it makes intuitive sense that you might um, have more that you need your hands for during bottle feeding versus breastfeeding. You might be more likely to have a hand free, um, which is something that we, we noted. So, um, so overall, uh, hopefully I've kind of shown you that we, we do see this happening during parent-child interactions and during infant feeding in particular. Um, our data suggests that this is a, a prevalent thing for families to be using their um, devices during feeding, um, but there is some variability that we likely have some heavy users and some light users. And so probably being able to distinguish this, that would be very important. Um, so that we could tailor uh, our recommendations and support based on what's actually going on during feeding interactions. But the big question is, should we be worried about this, right? So, um, so now I'd like to just kind of walk you through the research that's been done on this, but also make sure that we have a, a balanced perspective too. Um, because I want to emphasize that technology has brought so many good things to our lives, right? That there are really a lot of important benefits to the integration of mobile devices and various technologies within the home. And, and I think we need to appreciate that and appreciate um, what, what this may do to really support parents in their roles. And there's some research suggesting that when mothers uh, use social media, especially in the, the early um, part of the, the first year when they're adjusting the motherhood, um, this mothers report this is really beneficial to them. It helps them feel connected to their extended family and friends. Um, it can help them find resources and information that they need. Of course, that might be varying levels of quality. Um, that's not always evidence-based advice, but that kind of um, psychological aspect of technology use, especially if it's helping helping parents feel like they're adjusting to parenthood is, is really important to acknowledge and, and to protect. Um, parents also report that um, they use mobile devices to regulate their emotions, that this can be a way for them to uh, kind of cope with some of the negative emotions that may come with parenting or difficult parent-child interactions. If they're feeling disconnected or bored or stressed, um, especially during, you know, early infancy, if they can't really just leave the house and get away, this can be a way for them to have a break um, that allows them to also still be at home with their children. And um, that can be important too, right? We, we need outlets um, when we're feeling frustrated. Um, there's also research showing this is an important um, way to balance work life, right? And I think we've all experienced that over the past couple of years with the pandemic, that that work-life balance can be very difficult, but technology can also help us with that so that we can be home with our families more, but also stay on top of, of work, um, hopefully in ways that are, are balanced. So, so these benefits, again, are really important to acknowledge and, and to think about how we can protect those. But we do also um, have increasing concern that these technologies may lead to um, a term uh, that's been coined in recent years called technoference, where we have interference with responsive parenting and parent-child interactions that occurs when parents are using their devices. And so um, there have been uh, there's been a lot of research over over the past decade or so on this, and um, much of it has been with older children, but I do want to kind of summarize what's what's been found with older children before I think about um, effects of this during infancy. 
And so studies that are looking at parent-child interactions um, have looked at several different contexts. And so there have been some that have looked at mealtimes. Um, and so, you know, one of the initial studies that got a lot of attention was done by Jenny Radeski and her colleagues in 2014, where they um, did field observations of families at a fast food restaurant and looked at families who were um, using devices versus not and um, did coding of their behaviors. And um, several other studies have, have come out with similar designs, but also lab-based studies too that have um, looked at parent-child interaction during meals. And consistently, these um, observational studies suggest that when technology is involved in mealtimes, and in particular when parents are using their mobile devices during meals, um, there's less conversation between parents and children. Parents are less responsive to their children's cues and their children's bids for attention. Um, we see an escalation of children's bids for attention that they may kind of ramp up um, what they're asking for if their parents not is, is immersed in their mobile device. Um, and when these heavily immersed parents do respond, their responses are harsher, um, that they may have less patience for their children when they're trying to juggle um, absorption with their device with, um, with their children's needs during meals. There have also been studies that have looked at uh, supervision context. So um, similarly, these are like field observations where um, they were at a public pool and looking at parents who are using their, their device while they were, um, their children were swimming or in playground settings. Um, there was one experimental study where they actually had a mock home environment and had a bunch of risks in the, like a, a knife that was laying out and the stairs and they um, asked parents to use a device versus a computer versus nothing and compare um, the quality of parent supervision. And so across these studies, we similarly see that um, there is less engagement, less visual and attention. So there may be some uh, decreased quality of supervision. Um, but when we actually talk to parents, they do report that in these situations, they prioritize supervision. So they try to make sure that they're checking in with their, their children um, often and, and balancing their device use. So, so it's, it's um, I guess, promising to hear that parents are aware um, that, that this may be a little bit risky in supervision um, context, but we do have you know, some good data suggesting that they are, their, their quality of supervision is lower when they're engaged with devices in these settings. Um, there has been research looking at background TV. So if we have a TV playing in the background, um, in, you know, some families that's a, a um, constant for them is the TV is kind of always on, or maybe the, the parents watching TV and the child's playing on the floor. Um, and so when background TV is, is going on within the house and we observe what's going on with the children, we see that um, they have shorter play attention. So ch children are less, uh, focus. They have less attention on, you know, their, what they're playing with. Um, they're more distracted by the TV that's on and the, the noise that's in the background. And um, when we actually look at parent-child interaction, and these are experimental studies, um, we see that there's reduced quality of parent-child interaction when the TV's on in the background, that um, there's a lower quality of conversation, less conversation. So that distraction seems to be um, impactful in, in the quality of both play and, and parent-child interaction. Um, experimental studies have also looked at teaching interactions. So if we um, task a parent with trying to teach their child a new word or a new concept, and then we um, distract that parent by texting them in the middle of that teaching interaction, we do see impacts there too, that um, parents are less effective teachers. We see lower quality in learning when we have um, interruptions in these parent-child teaching interactions. So overall, uh, I think the theme here is that these are short-term studies, so we should acknowledge that's a caveat that, that none of these studies can really speak to the long-term effect. But these short-term studies that um, range from observational to experimental data consistently show that these disruptions do seem to disrupt um, the quality of interaction and the outcome of these short-term interactions in terms of you know, the quality of play and learning that goes on. So, so I think, it, in this data focused on slightly older children, we do have some cause for concern and maybe um, supporting parents and thinking about um, if they do need to use technologies in this, this context, how to make sure they're balancing that with their, parent, their children's needs within these contexts.
But to move on to thinking about infancy and whether you know the research that's been done with infants echoes what we've seen here, we um, do see uh, consistent associations between um, maternal technology use and infant temperament and attachment. And so in some of the work we've done, we see that um, moms who use their technology more frequently, so do things like you know use their mobile devices and watch TV more frequently during infant feeding and care interactions, um, this is associated with greater infant negative affectivity. Um, and we also see that mothers report lower feelings of attachment to their baby and greater hostility toward motherhood. So both of these are um, indicative of maybe a poorer transition to motherhood, that moms aren't feeling as connected to their babies and feeling resentful of the things that they've had to, to give up as they tr tr transition to parenthood. Um, but I will say that these are cross-sectional data. And so we don't exactly know from, from these, even though we find this consistently across um, several, several samples, um, we don't exactly know whether it's that the mom is using her device and this is causing her baby to be fussier and for her to feel less connected to her baby, or whether moms who are already feeling less connected or feel like their babies are more difficult um, are using their devices more because that's how they're coping or, or trying to, um, to feel more connected. Um, so I think this is a really important thing to acknowledge with a lot of this work that's been done so far, so far since we are still pretty early in the research that we've done on this topic, a lot of these cross-sectional findings really could be interpreted either way, that, um, that it could be that, that parents who are just not doing so well are using their technology more um, versus the technology is, is impacting um, their child development and their attachment to their child. Um, and so just to, I guess, emphasize this further, we do have um, some research in, in slightly older infants that, um, that suggests this bidirectionality, that when parents have um, more, more difficult children, so children with more um, behavioral issues or negative affectivity, that this may lead them to use their devices more as a, a way of coping. Um, and this is probably mediated by parent stress, that we see that parents who are more stressed are using their devices more. And so this can be a way of, of them really trying to um, regulate the stress that they're feeling around parenting. Um, but in a um, study by McDaniel and Radeski, they actually had longitudinal data on this and showed bidirectional effects, that, that there may have been some initial kind of use of technology to cope with difficult parent-child interactions and difficult child behaviors, but that technology used to seem to exacerbate the child's behaviors over time. Um, and those associated with greater internalizing than externalizing in the child during later childhood. So, so it, there does seem to be kind of um, bi-directional effects here in either direction. And we do have some experimental studies that um, give us some compelling evidence of direct impacts of device use on infant behavior. And so in particular, um, there have been several studies that have used a modified still face paradigm to understand direct effects of technology use on infant behavior. And so um, it, if you've never heard of the still face paradigm, um, I'll give you a little, little brief overview here, but this is a, um, a very widely used um, paradigm to look at how um, parent disengagement uh, might affect infant behavior and um, it's been used for decades to, to kind of get at, at different aspects of how um, when a parent is not emotionally available, for example, in the case of postpartum depression, um, how that might affect infant emotional functioning and self-regulation. So within this experimental protocol, what the researchers do is they um, it would bring the caregiver and baby into the lab or maybe observe them in their home, but they would have three different phases that they would ask the, the caregiver to um, to facilitate. The first is just a play interaction. So for two minutes, the, the mom and baby would just play with each other like they typically would at home. And then um, for the next two minutes, so for the second phase, the, the mom is asked to just shut down. So just to kind of not react to the baby, have a still face, and just kind of sit there for two minutes, um, non-responsive, which I'm so impressed that um, moms can do that <laughs> for, for the sake of research. Um, that's that's uh, is very hard to do. 
Um, so after that two minute still face uh, uh, phase, then um, the mom is asked to re-engage with the baby, kind of go back to normal, have a, a, a reunion phase where for two minutes they just kind of either calm their baby down or play with their baby like they normally would. So again, the, the, um, what this allows us to do is really see like during that, that phase two, during the still face um, phase uh, of two minutes, how does the baby react when the mom is not responsive, when the mom is physically present, but emotionally, act, uh, emotionally absent. Um, and typically research using the still face paradigm show that, that this is a very uncomfortable situation for babies. They're not used to their, their moms being unavailable. Um, and so they, you, we see increases in negative affectivity and decreases in positive affectivity. It's a very stressful, um, socially stressful uh, situation for babies. Um, and so, Researchers have kind of taken this this paradigm, this protocol here, and modified it so that we have a mobile device uh, mediated still face paradigm. And so, if we think about it, there are con some conceptual similarities here, right? If we're engaged with our mobile device, we may be very similar to this still face phase where we're looking at our device, we're not responsive to those around us, um, we're we're not you know showing emotion that's contingent on on what those around us are are doing, um, so it's really kind of trying to to capitalize on you know the similarities um, between these two settings and see how this might impact infant behaviors. So again, during this modified mobile still face paradigm, we have an initial two minute. A play phase where the mom and baby are just playing as they typically would. And then the experimental experimentalers ask the mom to look at a mobile device for two minutes and just look at the device and not, not respond to the baby. Then they have a two minute reunion phase where uh, the mom can re-engage with the baby. And so really then our, our focus in these studies is what happens during phase two? Um, how does the baby react to the mom checking into her device and checking out with the baby? Um, but also what happens during phase three? How well do babies calm themselves down? Um, and is that um, you know, an indicative of, of variability in self-regulatory skills? And so what these studies have find, found in using this um, mobile device still find face paradigm is that we do see direct impacts of maternal mobile device use on infant emotional expression, at least in the short term. So during this second two minute phase where the mom is focused on her mobile device and um, not on her infant, we see significant increases in negative affectivity. So infants protest and cry and um, have a lot more negative emotional expressions during this phase. We see decreased levels of positive affectivity, so less smiling and laughing and enjoyment of um, interacting with the mom. Um, they become less engaged um, with their mothers, partly because there's less to engage with. Um, and uh, we see them, increase their frequency of attentional bids. So they definitely notice, you know, that their their mom is engaged with their device and they try to counteract that by um, by protesting and, and increasing their, their bids for attention. And interestingly, these um, studies have also looked at whether um, additional characteristics of moms and babies, so in particular, how frequently the mom typically uses her device, whether this moderates you know, any of these associations or, or predicts um, other aspects of infant behavior. And um, these, these studies have found um, these correlational associations between the frequency of mobile device use for mothers and um, infant behavior. And so in particular, um, when moms typically used mobile devices more, their infants uh, explored the room less during that still face phase. So they were kind of less adventurous and curious um, in the experimental uh, setting in the room. Um, and they were also had poorer recovery during that reunion phase, suggesting that maybe there's some poor self-regulation skills that have developed um, in the face of maternal mobile device use. Um, we have also kind of further explored the, the associations we've seen between, between the infant negative affectivity and maternal mobile device use. Um, and um, we're interested to find age differences in these associations, which 
um, could suggest, you know, change over time, uh, effects of mobile device use on, on infant, aspects of infant temperament. And so um, what this figure here is showing, we have um, the frequency of mom's technology use on the x-axis, ranging from never to always. And on the y-axis, we have um, infant negative affectivity, which was measured by the um, infant behavior questionnaire. And um, the two different lines that you see are representing the association between these two factors for younger versus older infants. So um, the yellow line that you see for younger infants shows that there's a strong positive correlation between mom's tech use and infant negative affectivity. So the more the mother is using her, um, her technology, mobile devices, um, the more negative affectivity her infant um, it, it, it was a higher score on the um, infant behavior questionnaire for negative affectivity. Um, but we see that this seems to dampen as children get older, that there's um, still a significant association between um, these these characteristics of uh, moms and babies, but it's, it's less. Um, and I'll interpret this in a minute for you, but I also wanted to share with you that we see um, similar age differences for um, another aspect of infant temperament, infant orienting regulatory capacity. And so this is the infant's self-regulatory skills. Um, and so here we see a somewhat different um, moderating effective age where you can see in the, the gold line there for younger infants, there's no association between how frequently a mom is using her technology and um, the infant's self-regulatory skills. But we see that um, over time, so for older infants, there's a um, negative association, meaning that when moms are using their devices more, their infants have poor self-regulation skills. And so um, to just kind of summarize and interpret these for a little bit, these associations, the first figure that I showed you, um, the association between maternal technology use and infant negative affectivity, it was stronger for younger infants than older infants. And so this may mean that infants become habituated to maternal tech use over time. They may kind of get used to it, maybe aren't as reactive to it um, if it's a regular thing for them. Um, but it, it could also be that mothers are more likely to use technology in response to more difficult infant behaviors during early infancy. Maybe this is a, a way that mothers are coping when their babies are younger and, and their babies have higher levels of negative affectivity. Um, in terms of the second figure that I showed you, these associations between orienting and regulatory capacity being not significant during early infancy, but it is there is a significant negative association during older infancy, um, may be developmental effects that um, if moms are repeatedly using technology, um, that may be affecting their responsiveness engagement, which would negative impact, negatively impact the development of um, their baby's orienting and regulatory capacity, their self-regulation skills. So, um, so I want to move to talking specifically about feeding interactions, which is where a lot of our work has focused, um, which I think will emphasize some of the things that I've been talking about in more kind of general parenting interactions. And so, um, again, you know, to think about this idea of con responsive feeding that I um, talked to you about previously, um, we, we are curious to see whether engagement with distractors may interfere with responsive feeding. So we kind of have these ideals, these pictures that I showed you earlier of breast and bottle feeding moms who are making eye contact and really engaged with their babies during feeding. Um, and then again, our, our question is, you know, whether these interactions are changing when moms are doing things like using their computers or tablets or mobile devices. And even from these pictures, we, we can see differences, right? That there's, there's not engagement, there's not eye contact going on here. Um, and so a, a question is, you know, whether this, this is really impacting the quality and outcome and long-term outcomes of feeding interactions. I will note that we even have, you know, devices on the market these days that uh, facilitate this. And although these may be, you know, well-meaning, um, they are really maybe encouraging this hands-free feeding um, where parents are able to do things like uh, swipe and feed or, you know, take selfies during feeding, which, um, you know, we, we kind of question whether that's really necessary or something that we want to be encouraging families to do. And, um, 
I will note that there is literature in older children and adults on this idea of distracted eating, you know, so um, you may be familiar with some of these research, but we, we actually have a lot of good experimental data looking at what happens when we watch TV while eating our meals or use uh, our computers. Uh, we, we eat while texting or engaging in social media. And these studies consistently show that um, when we're distracted um, during mealtimes, uh, we tend to overeat, that, that we aren't as attuned to our hunger and fullness cues and, and what we're eating. And um, this, this may lead us to, to eat more than we would if we weren't distracted and eating more mindfully. And so these are data just from one experimental study that looked at this where they had uh, participants come and either have a deal uh, a meal of macaroni and cheese so that's the mnc that you see on the x-axis or pizza so they were looking at kind of maybe a more amorphous food of macaroni and cheese where you have a big bowl of it um, versus pizza which, which is more of a discrete food where you have um you know slices of pizza that maybe is easier to keep track of how how much you eat um, and with, within these meals, they had participants either during one meal of either mac and cheese or pizza, they just listened to music. So it was a relatively distraction uh, free meal with just some light classical music in the background. Um, so that's the white bars that you see on the figure, or they had um, participants watch a TV show and that's the black bars that you see on the figures. Um, and so what the researchers found is that uh, cal caloric intake was greater when TV was on during the meals that um, whether the participants were eating macaroni and cheese or pizza, they ate significantly more calories if they were eating in front of the TV versus just listening to light music, and they ate a greater volume of food as well. And so again, um, this is just one study of many that have showed that when we do things like eat in front of a, a screen, um, that there is a diminished awareness of our internal uh, satiation cues. And so this may lead us to eat in response to these more overt external cues, like how much, uh, how many chips are in the bag or how much food is on our plate, because we don't have what may need a, a little more attention and awareness of, of eating in response to hunger and fullness cues. And so, um, so I, I bring this up because we can think about how these uh, findings might translate to feeding interactions where we have some similarities, right? Where we really want parents to be tuned in to their baby's um, cues, which may be more subtle. It may require a little more attention and awareness. And um, we don't want parents to be focused on these more overt cues, like how much time has been going on, the, the meal duration, um, you know, how long their baby's been feeding, or how much milk is in the bottle, which is a very potent overt cue, but it's really not what we want um, parents to be feeding in response to. And um, in the work that we've done on this, we see that when mothers are using technology during feeding, it is associated with less desirable feeding practices. So mothers who report more frequent use of technology during feeding, they are also more likely to be using food to soothe their baby, um, which is uh, not a desirable practice. We really want families to be using non-food techniques to soothe their fussy baby so that they're not overfeeding. Um, these mothers also report greater levels of pressuring feeding styles, so they're more likely to try to get their um, child to, to finish their plate or to drink all the milk in their bottle. Um, and they also report greater levels of what we call laissez-faire feeding style, meaning um, they're not very involved. They, they're just kind of um, getting food into their baby, but not really engaging their baby during feeding. So for example, um, propping a bottle up and, and not holding a baby during feeding. Um, propping a bottle up on a towel would be an example of a uh, laissez-faire feeding practice. So, um, so overall, we do see these associations between less desirable feeding practices and maternal technology use. Um, these are from self-reported data. So again, these are correlational. But we did do an experimental study where, um, similar to the, the feeding study that I presented to you with adults, we had a similar kind of setup where we asked moms to come and feed their babies in our laboratory. And during one uh, feeding, there, was, there were no distractions. They just kind of fed their, their baby in a quiet room. And during the other feeding, we um, had them feed their baby while watching a TV show. And so moms could pick from you know, four different popular sitcoms and, and we'd set it up on a tablet for them to watch while feeding their baby. These are all breastfeeding mothers. Um, we had 20, 
25 moms who participated in this experiment. And um, we video recorded the feeding interactions so that we could later do behavioral coding. And we used the parent-child interaction feeding scale to uh, look at the quality of the interaction, both what the mom and the baby were contributing to the interaction when technology was present versus absent. And the main findings of this study were that we saw um, a trend towards a, a decrease in mom sensitivity, that moms were slightly less sensitive to their baby's cues when technology was um, present during the feeding versus not. But um, the most significant change was that moms engaged in less cognitive growth fostering when they were watching uh, TV on a, a tablet compared to when they were not. So this means moms were talking to their baby less, um, the, the speech with lower quality, um, they were doing less labeling of um, what the, the baby was eating or what was going on, you know, in the broader context. Um, so there was a, a lot less engagement um, when moms were watching TV versus not during a feeding interaction. Interestingly, though, when we looked at what was going on with the babies during these experimental conditions, we saw that there, it kind of depended on whether this was a novel experience for the baby or not. Um, so we, in this study, also asked moms, like, how typical is this for you? Do you always use, or do you often use technology while feeding your baby or not? And so um, this, the, the mom's response to this question was a moderating factor when, when we looked at effects on technolo mom's technology use on babies. And so um, this figure, similar to the figures I just showed you, um, compares the feeding condition where moms were not distracted versus distracted by technology. And on the y-axis, we have the um, infant's responsiveness to the mother, so how engaged the infant was to, to the mom during the feeding and responsive to the, the mom's um, talking and, and bids for attention. And um, the two lines that you see here, the, the red line represents um, dyads where the mom often used technology during feeding. So this was kind of a common thing for them to, to have maybe the TV or a, a tablet involved in feeding. And the black line represents um, mothers who typically did not use technology during feeding. And so we can see that for these babies who mom's technology use during feeding was common, this was often happening, the, the infant was similarly responsive to the mom during the no distraction versus tech distraction condition. So there didn't seem to be any impacts of condition on infant behavior. It was really for these babies that this was like a new thing for them or not something that happened very often, that they were less responsive to their mom when their mom was distracted by technology. It may have been that the baby was distracted too, that <laughs> they, heard the, they heard the show going and were curious about it and it just wasn't something they were used to. Um, but it, we, we found this to be really interesting because it suggests that maybe babies get used to this, you know, if if it's something that they're used to their mom doing, it it doesn't impact their behavior as much. Um, it could also mean that moms recognize if their babies aren't very responsive to it and they're more willing to use technology if they don't feel like it's impacting their baby very much. So definitely opens a lot of new questions, but it's interesting to see these um, these moderating factors of how typical this was for, for babies. And I will say we just uh, published another study with um, toddlers where we similarly um, were observing moms and toddlers during a, a typical mealtime interaction. And we coded whether moms were using TV or mobile devices during the feedings. And um, I don't show these findings here, but we did find that, that moms were less responsive to their child's cues when they were using um, TV or mobile devices during feeding. So we kind of saw that consistent effect of lower sensitivity when a, a TV or mobile device was involved at the feeding. But it, we were interested to also see that um, the, the child had stronger cues when the mom was using a TV or a mobile device. And that's what these figures are showing here, that we observed these feeding interactions and coded the strength of children's early satiation cues. So they're kind of um, initial cues indicating that they were done feeding, as well as their more active satiation cues, um, which is on the lower figure. So this would be things like throwing their spoon or their plate, um, a really strong native uh, cue that, that the, the child was done eating. And so we found that both of these cues were significantly, uh, or the, the early satiation cues were significantly stronger when a mom was using a TV mobile device. Um, and there was a trend for cues, the negative active cues to be stronger. So these are in line with, I think, what we saw in our, our um, 
experiment that I was previously telling you about, that children seem to be speaking up here, um, and that could be an adaptive effect, that they realize if, if my mom is using TV and mobile devices, I need to speak up to make sure to, to get her attention. We've been particularly interested in, um, so the the experiment I just told you about was with breastfeeding mothers, but we um, have been particularly interested in bottle feeding too, and how technology use during bottle feeding, um, even though this, this may be less frequent based on the previous data I showed you, um, it, it's possible it could be more impactful because bottle feeding offers more of these contextual cues. And if we think that distracted feeding is leading parents to be more responsive to these overt contextual cues and less responsive to their child's more subtle um, you know, behavioral cues, then um, bottle feeding may be uniquely impacted by maternal tech use. And in particular, our research shows that there are more opportunities for parents to feed in response to contextual cues. Um, parents are using a clear bottle typically where they can see how much their baby has, has um, is consumed, and we know that these contextual cues influence how much parents feed their babies, especially compared to breastfeeding, where you don't have those same cues. Um, we also found that when bottle feeding moms are distracted, they're less sensitive to their baby's cues during these bottle feeding interactions. Um, and when babies are lower on orienting or regulatory capacity, when so when they're already poor regulators, they these babies feed more when their moms are distracted, um, which we interpret to be if if the mom is not available to give that baby the support needed to regulate during feeding, um, that the the babies are feeding more when they have a distracted mom versus a mom who's more attentive to their baby's cues. And um, we've seen that over time, when moms have lower tech use, this is associated with greater um, weight change for babies, measured by a weight for length disease score change from birth to entry into the study. Um, but we see this for formula-fed infants only, not for breastfed infants. And so, as you can see here on this figure, we have um, weight for length disease score change from births to study entry. And this is just for the breastfed infants that were in our study. And so you can see there's really no difference based on mom's technology use in change for weight for like C-score um, across this period. But we did see a, a difference uh, based on mom's technology use for formula fed babies that um, there was for moms who didn't frequently use technology, um, there was a, a pretty stable weight for length Z-score uh, from birth to study entry. But for moms who are highly engaged in technology during infant feeding, um, we see a significant positive increase in weight for the Z-score. So suggesting that when mothers are um, engaging with technology during feeding, this may increase risk for overfeeding and, um, and lead to greater weight change for these formula-fed babies. So, um, so I've given you a lot of different findings here. So I'll give you kind of a, a summary here of what other research from our lab and others suggest in terms of um, potential implications of maternal technology use during infant feeding interactions. So we've seen that when, uh, when mothers are engaging with technological distractors during feeding um, and, and infant care, that, that this is associated with poor adjustment to motherhood, um, we see a pretty consistent association with greater child negative affectivity and um, some suggestion that over time this is associated with lower self-regulatory skills or lower orienting regulatory capacity for, for children. Um, it seems that engagement with technology during feeding um, is a constellation, part of a constellation of non-responsive feeding practices that we, as I um, showed you, this is associated with more use of pressuring feeding practices and, um, and laissez-faire feeding practices. So, so it seems like this may, um, may be kind of part of a, a broader trend for these mothers to be less responsive to their children during feeding. And so uh, technology use may directly impact some aspects of that, but may also be just kind of another tool that these these mothers have that they're using um, during feeding. Um, but we do have experimental evidence that um, kind of directly shows us, that, at least in the short term, when technology is involved in a feeding, it decreases the quality of feeding interactions, mainly by decreasing mother's engagement with their infants and lowering the amount of cognitive growth fostering that's going on during these feeding interactions. 
Um, but we had we were intrigued by the possibility that there may be some adaptation that that children may um, th they definitely recognize when this is happening, but they may um, habituate to it. They may strengthen their cues, um, but you know these are short term, so we don't really know whether this is a positive adaptation or whether something that over time um, would be problematic. But there is some suggestion that it may um, be associated with poor child self-regulation in the long run. And then what I um, most recently showed you was that we see greater weight gain for bottle feeding infants um, when their mothers are engaging with technology during feeding. So. Our ultimate question then is based on what we know, um, the research has been done, should we be worried? And so, you know, what I've shown you today is, is what we know, right? And so we had these four kind of broad topics that we talked through. And I think kind of the main conclusions from each of these is that we know that attentive, responsive parenting is, is really important. We have um, decades of research uh, emphasizing how important it is for parents to be attentive and responsive to their, their children's cues and needs. And we um, know that feeding is a, an important early context for parenting, that we want these feeding interactions to be responsive and for parents to be attentive during these interactions. Um, we know that families are using technology in various parenting contexts, um, and in particular infant feeding as a, a common context for um, parent technology use. And we have, I think, early preliminary findings suggesting that there are at least short-term impacts of technology use on parent-child interactions. But I think there's still a lot that we don't know. And um, we have a lot of emerging you know, longitudinal research that is much needed. And so um, much of what I showed you were short-term studies where they were cross-sectional or experimental studies that were able to speak to short-term impacts of technology use on um, child behavior and parent-child interactions. Um, but we don't yet have a lot of great data that is, can inform us into the long-term implications. So we can speculate based on what we know around child behavior and adjustment and attachment. Um, but I really look forward to um, a couple years from now when I think we'll have a lot more longitudinal data, long-term data that allows us to better understand the implications of these short-term effects that we're seeing. And I think we still um, have a lot to learn about the directions of effects and probably, you know, all these questions that I've posed here are true, that um, that there are probably parents who are already less responsive, and so they're more willing um, to use technology around their kids or maybe um, more in need of technology to regulate their negative behaviors. Um, there are probably maybe some initial things going on that's um, that's influencing the parent's use of technology and willingness to use technology within family context. Um, but you know, I think that it's also quite possible from what we've seen so far and probably what we will find in the future that using technology is impacting parents' attention and sensitivity and um, responsiveness to their children. So there may be also direct impacts of technology on parents' um, interactions with their children. Um, and there also definitely seem to be bi-directional effects here that um, when parents are feeling stressed, when they're feeling depressed, when they're struggling with their children's behaviors that using technology might be an effective way, in some ways, an effective way to, to cope. And we can think about um, how we might want to support parents in that way. Maybe if, if we're recognizing that's how they're using technology, we can help them recognize that and also develop additional coping skills or alternative co coping skills um, that um, will be more beneficial to them and to their parent-child interactions. And so I think, you know, our ultimate question that we still need to figure out is um, how can we balance this, right? So how can we make sure to appreciate the benefits of technology use and help parents to balance these benefits with their children's needs for responsive parents? Um, and so I think, you know, acknowledging that, the, the, it's probably unlikely that we're going to get families to remove technology from their home or maybe even use technology less, right? It's pretty infused with our life. And I think we, we can appreciate the benefits and make sure that parents aren't feeling guilty 
about this. So this is just another thing for them to feel bad about. Um, but really think about, okay, well, well, how can we work with this, right? How can we make sure that parents are definitely relishing in the benefits of technology and using it to make their lives easier, but maybe being selective with when they use it, recognizing that, you know, maybe it, when my baby's napping or engaged in other activities or with others, that's when I can really relish in technology. But um, when when my when I'm feeding my, my baby, that's maybe not my time to check out and and scroll, you know, Facebook. Um, that I, I should preserve that for a, a different time. Um, I think also helping parents understand. Um, you know, the, the balance in these interactions that their their um, infant's cues and needs should come first. But if if their baby's in a place where they're maybe needing a break or disengaged, that, that might be an okay time to engage with technology. Um, and I think as we we saw in our initial example of of this this dad and his baby, this beautiful interaction, we saw that technology can be used as an opportunity to check in and not check out. And so this might not be relevant for younger babies, but as children grow, um, making sure that that um, if tech, if you know you, the family's watching a TV show or um, or using some form of of uh, mobile device that that there's engagement there too, right? That, that there is uh, communication and, and opportunities to connect. Um, and the, the I think we have a lot to learn about how exactly we can uh, have nuance around these recommendations, but um, there's a lot of promise for making this work for families. So I would like to acknowledge um, the funding sources that supported this work. Um, we couldn't have done it without the, the generous grants and donations that we received. And um, I really appreciate your time and attention. Uh, I welcome any questions that you have now or feel free to reach out and contact me in the future too if you have additional questions that come up. So thank you.